What a perfect day to arrive in Roma. The best of all possible beginnings to our grand tour of Europe. We're going from Rome to London by train. And we'll spend our first three days right here in Rome. And we'll be taking you all around the city. We'll have walking tours, bus tours, evening restaurant tours. We'll be touring night and day. But before we get into all of the modern Rome and the real city, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of Rome. The history of Rome extends over two and a half thousand years. Snapshot capsule of the history of Rome because as Cicero says, unless we understand history, we'll re remain forever children. So we're going to help you grow throughout this tour and learn some of the culture, some of the events, the people, the places, the popes, the palaces, the grand monuments. Rolling along, let me tell you the story of the history of Rome. And what I'm going to do for you is divide it up into 500-year chunks. Makes it a little quicker that way. So let's briefly summarize by saying uh, 2,500 years ago, that's 500 BC, right? 500 BC, we have the beginning of the Roman Republic, it's called, the Roman Republic. And with that, we have a Senate with uh, politicians appointed for life, and they chose their ruler, and uh, this was no longer an Etruscan ruler, but it was now a Roman ruler. And this continued, the Republic continued for 500 years until the time of Julius Caesar. And Caesar came to power at about 50 BC. In the year 44 BC, Julius Caesar was anointed as dictator for life by the Senate. However, his life didn't last very long. A few months later, he was assassinated. His nephew took over, a young fellow by the name of Octavian. And this is about the year 29 BC. And Octavian became quite the ruler. He became the legendary Emperor Augustus. He did so well in his early years that he was crowned as the first emperor of Rome. And thus begins the next great phase of Roman history, the Roman Empire. Now during the, the preceding time, under Caesar and others, Rome had managed to conquer all of the Italian peninsula. So by the time of Augustus, just the Italian peninsula was under their control. But with Augustus, they began expanding because of all the loot that they could collect, all of the bounty and the gold and the grains. And they had a tremendous army already in place and a terrific administrative set system. And they were able to expand the empire through constant warfare. So there ensued several hundred years of warfare on the fringes of the empire and expansion and as well the Pax Romana because within the empire there was relative peace because the Romans were controlling it all. But on the fringe it was this constant expansion, expansion, expansion which culminated during the time of Trajan. The, the Roman Empire really peaked in the next century under the emperors Trajan and Hadrian about the year 120, 140. And under Trajan, the empire reached its largest geographic spread, occupying what are today 53 countries, all under Rome. And this is the capital that we're heading for, the capital of the world, Caput Mundi. Amazing, all the way up to Scotland, all the way down to southern Egypt, over to the Middle East, to Gibraltar, the whole Mediterranean, the whole world was Rome's. And then Trajan was followed by Hadrian, who was a, a very enlightened emperor, a scholar, a diplomat, an architect, a poet, a philosopher, and he stabilized the empire. And then a period of gradual decline set in, in the second century, 200 AD, 300 AD, decadence, competition, anarchy, some chaos, the barbarians growing stronger, until around the year 411, this is when the, the Gauls started sacking Rome, the Goths and the Visigoths. And by the year 474, the Roman Empire fell. The Western Empire was no more. So that's kind of the summary from 500 BC to 500 AD was the real time of glory of the Roman Empire. From 500 
to about 1500, not much happened in Rome. But this started to change in the 1470s. Here we have an increasing power of the popes. The Renaissance was beginning at this time in Florence under Brunelleschi and others, Ghirlandaio, Masaccio, that we'll see in a few days when we get to Florence. And by about the year 1495, they began to come down to Rome. Michelangelo, Bromante, and others that we'll be running into, Raphael. So the early 1500s was a great time of development in Rome. The arts really began to flourish. Architecture, paintings, churches, plazas. And by the way, we're gonna go into a lot of churches and it's not uh, really a religious visit that we're paying, although if you're religious, you'll get that much more out of it. it it's more of a cultural and aesthetic experience to just view the beauties of the paintings and the sculpture. After all, all of the fortunes of that time were poured into the churches because of the power of the Pope and the importance of the religion and the churches. So the money, it was like the MTV of their generation. It was the theater of their generation. This is where culture and the arts were really developing. And to the point where it almost became decadent, so much of the society's money was poured into building the churches like St. Peter's that um, reactions to this developed, in, particularly in the form of Martin Luther in 1520, who wrote his uh, great Reformation thesis and nailed it on the church door in Germany. And this quickly spread throughout Europe, Northern Europe and it became a very important force in the dispute between Northern Europe and Southern Europe, which was really a political and an economic battle. And by 1527, Rome was sacked again by the armies of the North from Northern France and Germany. And they marched into this Renaissance city and they burned and looted and plundered. And then Rome bounced back and recovered. And by the late 1580s, Rome once again was producing some great artworks. We have, um, well, there's other popes. Julius II was the pope in charge during Michelangelo's time, say 1500 to 1515, and then Leo X came in, and he was the one who really presided over the grandeur and the beauty and the decadence leading up to Martin Luther in 1520. Leo X was the son of Lorenzo the Magnificent from Florence, of the, the Medici family very wealthy, the most wealthy family in the world at that time. And he said that um, God has blessed upon us the papacy, so let's enjoy it. And they did. It was a grand court, the finest court in all of Europe, according to Stendhal, the most brilliant court. And there was a lot going on in that early 16th century. You with me so far? It's, it's quite a tale of the evolution of civilization. It's a big story. We could develop a, a whole semester, a whole lifetime, and still not get it. But we're moving along. 1580s, another pope came by, Sixtus V. And he was responsible for a lot of what we see today in Rome, in the historic center. He developed the street plans that we're going to be walking through, all from the 1580s. So keep that in mind as we walk through the historic center. It's mostly a city of, let's say, the 16th century. So that answers all your questions, right? What happened next was the Baroque period in the 17th century. We have, the, after Michelangelo, the artistic development kind of stagnated. There was very little change. It's called the Mannerist School. Very beautiful, but no real uh, innovations. Just copying the style of Michelangelo and Raphael, called Mannerism, in the manner of Michelangelo. But by the mid-1600s, along comes the Baroque artists coming out of Bologna. We have the Caracci family, Anibale Caracci. Uh, we have Caravaggio coming down again from the north of Italy, bringing this new school of Baroque art. And we're going to see a lot of the Baroque in Rome. It really is the world's center and capital of the development of this wonderfully embellished and dynamic and creative artistic movement that was found in painting and sculpture and architecture. And uh, this was reached the peak in the works of Gian Lorenzo Bernini. And we'll see quite a bit of the sculpture of Bernini. In fact, just in about an hour or two, we'll be walking into the Piazza Navona and we'll see his great Fountain of the Four Rivers. This was going on from 1640 through 1690, this fluorescence of Beautiful, beautiful artworks, and probably, to my mind, the peak of beauty that was ever reached.
in world civilization and world culture. Another of those artists was Borromini. They were great rivals, Bernini and Borromini. And we'll see both of their works together and in separate places as well. Well, after the Baroque period, what happened next during the, say, the 1740s was Rome was discovered by tourists. And originally, they were mostly British tourists. The nobility, the aristocracy, who had lots of money to burn from England, came down on the Grand Tour. And they would spend maybe two years traveling from the north uh, through Paris and so on, finally culminating in Rome. That was the great goal of that Grand Tour. And they would bring back the ideas from Rome to England, and you have the Palladian style developing in London and neoclassicism developing throughout the world as a result of the rediscovery of the beauties of Rome. And after that century, we have the 19th century, and again, there's more tourists coming into the city. Rome was living on its past glories, as it still is today. And you have American writers, among others, such as uh, Mark Twain and Washington Irving, and most notably Henry James, who wrote his first novel about Rome. And they spread the word of this great city through their writings. And then finally, bringing us up to date to the 20th century, we have the rise of modern tourism and the invasion of the new barbarians. That's us. <laughs> so we Hawaiians have come to Rome to conquer and enjoy its beauty. So let's enjoy and take advantage, OK? Thank you.